Good morning and welcome. My name is Tom Law. I'm the Head of Policy and Learning at the Global Forum for Media Development. On behalf of our over 120 members from over 50 countries, I was very grateful that UNESCO asked GFMD to co-organize this high-level session on the safety of journalists in the Ukraine war. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, UNESCO's Director General has officially condemned the killing of seven journalists who have died in the exercise of their work to inform the world of the realities of war. These condemnations can be found on UNESCO's Observatory of Killed Journalists, an online database providing information on the status of judicial inquiries into each killing of journalists or media workers recorded by UNESCO since 1993. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has underlined once again the essential role of independent ethical journalism in assisting citizens to make life or death decisions, informing the world and holding the powerful to account. As a powerful antidote to the disinformation and propaganda that categorize that characterize hybrid warfare and as a pillar of democracy upon which other freedoms and rights depend, journalism in Ukraine is undergoing a terrible assault. The safety and security of all journalists to report freely are essential to ensure that the world understands the reality and the facts of the ongoing war, including the humanitarian consequences. To discuss these issues, we have a truly excellent panel. With us here, Mr. Jeremy Deer, the Deputy General Secretary of the International Federation of Journalists. And joining us online, Ms. Teresa Ribeiro, the OSCE representative for the freedom of media. Ms. Rebecca Vincent, Director of Operations and Campaigns, Reporters Without Borders. Ms. Darina Shevchenko, CEO of the Kiev Independent. And Mr. Sergei Tomolenko, President of the National Union of Journalists in Ukraine. In the short time, the hour we have together today, we're going to try and do two things. Give you a picture of the terrible challenges facing journalists in Ukraine and a taste of some of the responses and to look ahead. What can be done that is within our gift, those in this room and those watching online, what is in our power to do collectively? Sergei, I'll come to you first. The National Union of Journalists of Ukraine has been tracking violations against journalists, and I believe they paint an even bleaker picture than the statistic of the seven journalists killed that UNESCO has tracked. So please, please, Sergei, go ahead. Okay. Dear Tom, dear colleagues, uh, thank you for your support and for your deep empathy to the Ukrainian topic. Uh, yep, uh, according to our verified information, information by National Union of Journalists of Ukraine. Uh, for this moment, 24 media workers have killed since the beginning of the large-scale Russian war in Ukraine. Four of them are foreign journalists. And uh, this figure is uh, much more than UNESCO fixed, and it includes all media workers whose professional background at the time of the war related to the media sphere. And uh, as you mentioned, UNESCO Director General condemns every case of murder for the journalist during the performance of professional duties. Seven such cases were recorded. At this moment, a number of journalists were seriously injured. In particular, we can mention the stories of the journalists and photojournalist Danish media Extra Blooded, Fox News correspondent Benjamin Hall, uh, or, for example, American journalist Julia Redondo. Journalists are purposeful targets for Russian soldiers, as we see. So the situation is very and very difficult and horrible. The work of independent journalists in the occupied territories is really dangerous for life. All media and well-known journalists are intimidated by Russians. And the Russians try to press and to silence every independent voice at the occupied territory. 
These include physical attacks, captivity and physical abuse of the family. Colleagues from the occupied regions are forced to close down and even go to hiding. Some of them continue to inform Ukrainians about the situation in their region, however, on condition of complete anonymity, without signature, without video, etc. It's also worth noting that hundreds or maybe thousands of journalists have been forced to evacuate with their families from regions with active hostilities, or these territories are occupied by Russians. Thank you, Sergei. Um, those numbers paint a, a, a terrible picture. And in addition um, to the, um, the stats that Sergei has just given, the International Press Institute have recorded nine deaths and over 350 media freedom alerts related to Ukraine. But Sergei, I wanted to ask you to um, give us more than just the numbers of journalists that have been killed and the number of threats. Could you share with us a, a couple of examples that illustrate the situation that you and your colleagues, and in some cases, the families of journalists are confronted with? Yep, Tom. Unfortunately, there are many more than a couple or two such cases, So, but I will focus on the most shocking. Both uh, cases uh, concern the two occupied regions of Ukraine, which are close to the occupied in 2014 Crimea. These regions are Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. The first uh, about the Russian soldiers kidnapped the 75-year-old father of editor-in-chief of the Melitopol rating online media, Svetlana Zelizetska. Currently, this town in the Zaporizhia region is occupied by the Russian military. So Ms. Zelizetska was forced to go to the territory controlled by Ukraine. As a result, the occupiers conducted a full search of Svetlana's house and took her father hostage. The Russians placed her elderly father in the basement. And on the evening of the first day of, the, of her arrest, Svetlana received a call with threats uh, that <clears throat> uh, threats that her father would be held in prison until she returned to the town. The occupiers demanded that the journalists start supporting the Russians. After only a few days, only after Svetlana declared that she was leaving her profession and her media, the occupiers released her father. And the second uh, case, or maybe the first case of the kidnapping in Ukraine of the journalists is Oleg Baturin from the Kherson region. This case became an indicator of a lot for all journalists, Ukrainian journalists on occupied regions. After this information, after this story with Oleg Baturin, most or many colleagues began to hide and try to leave their regions. The Russian military invited Oleg Baturin to a fake meeting and captured him. After that, he was detained for eight days. Physical force and psychological pressure were used against him. And all these days, the family and colleagues, our union, we didn't know where the journalist was being held, and they couldn't provide to the arrested the necessary medicine. Fortunately, Oleg Baturin and his family were able to evacuate from the occupied territory and are now in a safe location in Western Ukraine. But today, dozens and dozens of Ukrainian journalists are in fact being held hostage in the occupied territories as Russians are, block, are blocking exits. Thank you, Sergei. And uh, for those of you watching online, please leave your questions and comments uh, to any of our speakers, and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can at the end. So please do go ahead and leave your comments. Ms. Teresa Ribeiro, I'll come to you next. Um, as, the, as the representative of the Freedom of Media organization, 
at the Freedom of Media at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. When there is so little physical and cyber security for journalists in Ukraine, when rather than cooperation, we are seeing humanitarian, human rights violations and journalists being killed and taken hostage, as we've just heard, what is the OSCE doing in response to these extreme violations against journalists? And what processes and mechanisms are available to you to hold perpetrators to account? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for having me uh, in this session, which I think is, uh, I'm sure, one of the most important sessions of, uh, uh, of today uh, in, uh, in the celebration, within the framework of the celebration of the World Press Freedom Day. Um, first of all, allow me just to pay tribute to all journalists uh, working in, uh, in Ukraine. I think this is important. Uh, imagine if we didn't have those journalists uh, in, uh, in place. We knew nothing about uh, what, uh, was going, what is going on uh, on the ground. So uh, what their work and their extreme difficult uh, uh, and challenging uh, situation and conditions, it's very, very important and allow us not only to follow almost on real time what is going on on the ground, but also it, uh, al it allows the collection of evidence-based uh, facts uh, that can be used later for accountability mechanisms to be presented to accountability mechanisms and courts uh, to illustrate um, possible violations uh, of humanitarian law, of human rights law, um, and also war crimes. So what they are doing is extremely important. Uh, and uh, what can I do? And what can I do as representative on freedom of the media? The representative on freedom of the media is an autonomous institution within uh, OSCE, which is an organization uh, for um, security uh, co security and cooperation in, uh, in Europe with a wide membership and, uh, and my institution. Uh, what should do and does is to uh, identify violations by the participating states regarding their commitments um, in the field of media freedom and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, freedom of expression. Um, at the same time, we also provide assistance uh, to the participating states in order um, to allow them to align their commitments and uh, their, their practices, their frameworks uh, um, with, with the commitments uh, that I mentioned before. So, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I would say these are the two main, uh, the two main missions uh, of, my, um, of my job. Uh, and what are the tools? And this is very important. First of all, my voice. And the voice is very important. And I will continue as, uh, you know, I'm, 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 close, uh, I'm closely following the situation uh, in Ukraine since the very beginning, since the beginning of the war. I have been very vocal regarding what is going on, regarding uh, uh, the attacks against journalists, the violence against journalists, the harassment, uh, um, abductions, etc. Um, all that is going on and that is really uh, putting uh, journalists in, uh, in, in a very, very dangerous uh, situation. So my voice is an important tool. Um, another is, of course, to engage with the participating states um, through, for example, what we call quiet diplomacy. Um, and also to um, also to join forces with other international organizations in order to um, make convergent and more effective efforts uh, to, um, to call the attention uh, on the situation in this specific case, on the war situation and on uh, the terrible impact on media freedom and freedom uh, of and freedom of expression uh, in uh, in the 
uh, in Ukraine. So I would say that uh, I have these mechanisms, these tools to use, uh, and of course uh, I have been using them uh, since uh, the beginning of the war in a very uh, in a in a regular uh, and systematic uh, uh, way. I also have been monitoring very closely the situation in the Russian Federation and the, and the deterioration that uh, we are witnessing there, because they are linked, uh, very much linked. Uh, we see in one side, we see the machinery, all the, the, all the machinery of propaganda, of propaganda for war, um, and the closing of uh, the, the, the media freedom space in Russia, and everything, and this is clearly linked with the war and is part of the war. So in Russia, what is happening regarding media freedom and freedom of expression is clearly related to uh, the war in Ukraine. And at the same time, as I said before, I'm following closely what is going on uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine on the ground uh, and um, and uh, I, um, I'm always uh, publishing uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, in the uh, of uh, press releases, statements, communiques uh, on the situation. Thank you so much for explaining your role and the capacities of your office, and the the point about the relationship between press freedom in Russia. And the, and, and the war was made very powerfully in a video by Nobel, Press Prize winner, Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, Dmitry Moratov. And I really suggest that you go and find it. It was played earlier at this, at this conference, but he very vividly explains uh, the, the connection. Um, Mr. Reza Ribeiro, I'd like you to, um, exp to use oh. your next comments to Tell us about the responses, diplomatic or otherwise, that you would like to see from other actors, for example, from UNESCO, from the UN Human Rights Council, and countries who are members of the Media Freedom Coalition. What could they do to complement the work that, that your office is, is doing? Thank you. Thank you very much. This is an important question. And since the beginning of the war, you know, uh, I, I really try with all my uh, with all my colleagues uh, in different institutions, really to try to train forces. I think this is the most important. We have different mandates, different responsibilities, but it's very important that we are able really to convey convergent messages if we want to, to be effective according to uh, the different tools that the different institutions uh, uh, have at their disposal. For example, yesterday, um, uh, not yesterday, sorry, the day before yesterday, but uh, ahead of the World Press Freedom Day, together with my colleagues, the, free, the, 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 uh, the mandate holders uh, of freedom of expression, of the UN, of the organization of the African states, of the, uh, uh, of the American states, of the African Commission, so the four institutions, the four mandate holders, we published a joint statement on the war uh, and it's, it's a very powerful one and once again is really uh, establish, establishing the connection between what is going on and the terrible situation and the deterioration of media freedom situation in Russia and Ukraine. This, I think, it's a powerful message. It's a message that in the end uh, in terms of the mandate uh, orders of freedom of expression and media freedom covers the entire world from Africa to America to everywhere. So I think this kind of, uh, uh, of um, joint initiatives are very important and send a very strong signal. So let's look at our particular uh, and uh, particular tools, let's use it um, on the best, as the best way, but at the same time, let's also uh, think about joint initiatives that can, in, in a way, can amplify what we are doing uh, in, uh, in our institutions 
or in, and only uh, in accordance with uh, our mandates. Thank you so much, Ms. Ribeiro. Uh, Rebecca Vincent, I'd like to come to you next. I remember watching you speak in Tallinn at the Global Conference for Media Freedom, and you had some very strong words about what governments and intergovernmental organizations are doing to meet these challenges. Um, indeed, an evaluation report presented at that conference, despite noting some areas for optimism, said that the Media Freedom Coalition needs a reset. Now, that was in early February, which seems uh, a world away now. But from your perspective as Director of Operations and Campaigns at Reporters Without Borders, how would you assess the Media Freedom Coalition's response to the invasion in Ukraine and indeed the other international mechanisms to address press freedom violations such as the Human Rights Council and UNESCO's Plan of Action? Um, thanks, Tom. And yes, in Tallinn, which indeed seems so long ago now, um, in particular, we were talking about the Media Freedom Coalition state's response to Afghanistan. And I think there are some lessons to be learned from that, um, because, of course, Afghanistan is still an ongoing crisis, and still the very same states are failing uh, to respond to the very pressing needs still of Afghan journalists who have been in need of assistance uh, since August. In Ukraine, the response has been different. I think, um, in particular, Europe responded in a different way. But I think from Afghanistan, one lesson that we can apply to this is that as, as these things drag on, as conflicts become more protracted, uh, perhaps, there's a danger of losing momentum. And so that's one thing I'd like to add to this discussion today is the response has been better in many ways, and we can go into why. But let's make sure it remains that way. Let's make sure that, uh, that attention is sustained to the situation uh, in particular, if the conflict continues in the weeks and months ahead. In terms of the Media Freedom Coalition, um, I have to be honest, they have not been particularly relevant in the emergency response that Reporters Without Borders and many other like-minded organizations have been uh, working on for nearly two and a half months now. Perhaps because of past experiences, um, it was not the best use of our precious time in this crisis to try uh, to kind of fight a system that hasn't been particularly supportive in the past. They did mobilize. Uh, the MFC states issued a statement. I think it took them about two weeks, and they got two-thirds of their membership to sign on, which is more than perhaps any statement has gotten in the past. We've seen some statements from the MFC with only a handful of signatures. So from their perspective, these states probably think that you know they did better than they have in the past with the MFC. But from our perspective, we were working to try to get very concrete assistance to those who needed it the most. And we knew that the MFC would not be the right place or the most efficient means of doing so. So perhaps that's a lesson learned as well for the MFC that going forward, um, you know, at this point, civil society is kind of assuming that we won't get the concrete support that we need from that group of states. There are things that could be done. We have very strong recommendations from the high level panel of legal experts on media freedom, particularly with regard to the need for emergency visa programs for journalists and for states to offer them a safe haven. Some states have taken in uh, Ukrainian journalists and other refugees, but there's not yet these systems to provide emergency visas for journalists as such. And we do know of journalists who need assistance now in exile. Um, but, but really, I think more pra practical assistance is needed in situations like this. Outside the MFC, the international response has been strong. We were particularly impressed by how quickly the donor community got its act together, very quickly working together, reaching out to groups like us, reaching out to uh, groups that we partner with on the ground in Ukraine to ensure that resources very quickly got where they were needed. Because what was true then and still remains true two and a half months into this crisis is we need uh, very concrete things. We need uh, protective equipment, we need radios, we need satellite phones, we need first aid kits, we need money for training and, and to help get people out of harm's way and settled in other places. So the donor community, and I'll include UNESCO in that, uh, responded very quickly. In fact, in my career, I think that response and the efficiency of it was unprecedented. And so I hope that's an indication that we can see such a response in terms of getting funds to the right place in future emergencies. And some political bodies have responded uh, very strongly on the policy level too, but the MFC is just not there. Um, we remain seriously concerned by the safety of journalist situation in particular. A lot of our efforts are focused on that. We work closely with our Ukrainian partner organization, the International 
uh, the Institute for Mass Information in Ukraine. We opened a uh, press freedom center in Lviv that will also shortly have full capacity in Kiev. We've been channeling assistance through that center, including loaning out uh, bulletproof vests and helmets, ensuring that journalists uh, have access to financial resources, psychological uh, resources, if they need digital assistance, if they need training, all of those things. Um, we, can, we can connect people to the right uh, resources through our centers in, in Lviv and, and very shortly in Kiev. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I wanted to quickly ask you um, just just to look at the situation in in Russia um, for a second. Yeah. Now, with us in Tallinn at the Media Freedom Coalition's meeting was the Nobel Peace Prize winner Dmitry Moratov, and since then his newspaper Novaya Gazeta has closed in response to the new laws effectively banning accurate factual descriptions of Russia's invasion and the, and the war in Ukraine. And what was left of independent Russian media is either in hibernation or starting their work again in, in exile. So I wanted, could you give us um, your analysis of the situation in, in, in Russia and what could be done to keep independent journalism in, in Russia alive? Yeah, thanks, Tom. And um, just yesterday, we launched uh, the 2022 edition of the World Press Freedom Index. So just to point to Russia's score on that index has dropped now to 155th out of 180 countries. And as well, Ukraine's score has dropped in particular because of the actions of Russian forces in Ukraine targeting journalists. Um, but indeed, um, I think the situation with Novaya Gazeta is, is emblematic of the broader situation in Russia. And Dmitry Muratov himself was recently attacked uh, with red paint and acetone, which damaged his eyesight. Um, journalists uh, who are trying to continue to work in, in Russia do so at great risk now. We've pointed to a clear witch hunt by authorities to the, the few remaining journalists trying to, to do independent work in the country. Um, many have fled and many are still trying to flee and need assistance uh, in exile. So we've launched another from the JX Fund, uh, which is a good place to channel assistance to, to those uh, to journalists who are now working in exile. But in the country, um, the policy is not just of censorship, direct censorship, but also um, a sort of attempt by the Russian authorities to isolate the Russian population. We feel, um, we really fear that these this destruction of pluralism, that the effects of this will be far will f be felt far after the end of this war. So this is a really alarming situation. And, I think that you know there are creative ways sometimes that we can assist media still working in the country or still trying to work from exile, but that situation is um, is is a parallel crisis, in fact, to the physical risks that journalists are facing in Ukraine. So that deserves international priority, support, and attention as well. Thank you, Rebecca. The nature of the situation we are in means that it's pretty much impossible to talk about solidarity, collaboration, support to Russian media and journalists without this falling into the, the Kremlin's playbook of labeling these efforts as foreign in interference. Um, instead of how most of us would see it who are celebrating World Press Freedom Day, we would see it as showing solidarity with our colleagues from the same profession who share our belief that journalism is a public good. Turn to you, Jeremy, who's here um, with us in, in, in Uruguay. This has been a hybrid conflict not just on the battlefield, but also on the airways and online. And could you give us, from what the IFJ, the International Federation of Journalists, have witnessed, how has this played out so far? Thanks, Tom. I, I think the wave of misinformation and disinformation in Russia and Ukraine didn't begin with the military invasion. For years, many of us have been warning about the huge efforts and resources being invested by many states, including Russia, in information warfare in order to shape the narrative, especially online. But of course, that information warfare has been taken to a new level since the Russian invasion. In fact, three unsubstantiated claims like the planned Ukrainian attack on Donbass were actually used to justify the invasion in the first place. And online troll factories have attempted to rewrite events like in Butcher and Russian embassies worldwide have been flooding online spaces with disinformation which denies any links to such massacres. And in fact, after the banning of um, uh, Russia Today and other states 
state media. Russian diplomats themselves have become this new state media. A 26% increase in the number of posts, 200% increase in the level of engagement as trolls um, re-tweet um, uh, um, those um, comments from Russian diplomats. Some countries say they've seen a 75% increase in levels of disinformation emanating um, from Russian sources. But the information warfare is not just online. We've seen it in other ways. We saw the bombing of at least 12 TV towers, three in one day alone on the 2nd of March. That has just one aim, to deny citizens access to independent media, to close down media who can expose those kind of war crimes. And we've seen things like the forced closure of media in the occupied territories, many through the ransacking of newsrooms and the destruction of media equipment, unprecedented levels of cyber attacks against media and individual journalists. And as Sergei um, said in the stories he's told, we've seen in those occupied areas journalists being detained, kidnapped and abused in an attempt to get them to collaborate with and repeat that Russian narrative. So one case, Alexander Gunko in the Kherson region, who was abducted and threatened shortly after his staff at his paper had received an email suggesting that they should collaborate and cover events correctly. And we've seen deliberate targeting of journalists like the Sky News crew who were wearing press jackets, clearly identified themselves, were not posing a danger and yet were shot at, lives being saved in that case only thanks to the protective equipment that they were wearing. And their crime in that instance was that they were on their way to Bucha to document the war crimes carried out there. And they're not the only ones who've been targeted in this way. We've received so many reports of seizure of equipment, seizure of documents, seizure of computers, and a catalog of attacks on media, cars, and film crews. Of course, it's not easy to combat um, such disinformation, but I think one of the things that the international community really needs to look at, in particular the donor community, is about making sure they provide resources to enable the fact-checking and the debunking of the misinformation, the resources for digital security to help um, Ukrainian journalists, and also, as a, as a slightly longer term one, resources for media literacy to enable citizens to better understand the kind of sources and who is behind the news that they're receiving. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I've been very concerned, and I'm sure that many of you here have been concerned, and I'm sure the IFJ has been concerned, about reports of how some international media have treated their Ukrainian colleagues when hiring them as field producers. We've heard about unequal access to personal protective equipment and other issues. So Jeremy, I wanted to ask, from your experience, how have international media been operating in Ukraine? Have they lived up to the expectations outlined by the ACOS Alliance, outlined by what IFJ has been calling for? And also, could you touch on to what extent the poor finances of Ukrainian media and the low pay of journalists as a profession play a role in the risks faced by Ukrainian journalists? Yes, yeah, certainly, and, and, and they play a huge role. The IFJ has always worked on the basis that we believe that there can be no real media freedom where journalists exist in conditions of corruption, fear, or poverty. And poverty is not just low pay, although that's been a huge issue for Ukrainian journalists for many years, especially those working online. But it's also about a lack of insurance, a lack of social protections, a lack of training, a lack of expenses for freelance journalists, a lack of secure contracts, the abuse of labor rights which breed precarity. I mean, along with Sergei's union in 2020, we did a, a study of the, the kind of situation in relation to COVID and, and journalists' uh, pay and rights. In 20% of media, they unilaterally cut journalist salaries. One in every five media companies forced all staff to take unpaid leave. 28% of freelance commissions were cut with no compensation. And that lack of income means that things like insurance and protective equipment become unaffordable for those freelancers or for those journalists. And the lack of insurance means when they are killed or injured, their families are left in poverty. 
It means not getting the best medical treatment. It means where working conditions are precarious, journalists are sacked because they can no longer fulfill the role because they've been injured. The lack of risk assessments, evacuation plans, safe communication. So the lack of resources for media and for journalists adds to their danger. And the situation for staff journalists is bad, but it's even worse for freelancers. Often local journalists relied on by international media, where there is all too often a failure to uphold the same duty of care. And this isn't the first time we've seen this. We've seen it in Myanmar, in Afghanistan, in Palestine and others. And so when this war is over, and let's hope it's sooner rather than later, and the media development community talk about rebuilding Ukraine's independent media, let's ensure that we do so based on some core principles of decent pay, fair contracts, insurance, social protections, of media employers who fulfill their duty of care, where journalists are trained in physical and digital safety and have access to the tools and resources to do their job professionally. Just finally on your, your point about international media, it's true this is not just Ukrainian media that we're talking about. The IFJ will not be the only one of the organisations represented here to have received calls from international and in some cases large and publicly funded Western media asking us a small organisation to supply personal protective equipment to their staff or from young or local freelancers seeking to make a name for themselves um, and being encouraged in doing that by international media to put themselves in harm's way on the off chance their photo story or film is picked up. When asked, when asked if they're trained or why they've not got equipment, they say because they cannot afford it. And that cannot be an acceptable way for media to operate after this war is over. Thank you, Jeremy. Some very practical suggestions for all of us to, to follow up on and to, and to call on. Uh, Darina Shevchenko, from the, the CEO of the, the Kiev Independent, could you pick up on that connection between the financial realities faced by media in Ukraine and the, the safety issues which Jeremy was speaking out about? And what role does that play in your experience? Is there a culture of buying insurance, for example, and how hard is it to persuade mission-orientated journalists not to endanger themselves because of their zeal to report on the war crimes and other violations in Ukraine? Darina, we can't hear you. Could you unmute yourself? Thank you. Yes, one thing I, wanna, I wanted to say is that the problem I'm trying to solve is not how to persuade mission-driven journalists not to go and report on war crimes, but how to give the equal opportunities to all media professionals who actually want to go and do their job but have concerns, have families to take care of, and, you know, are still, their job is still important. You know, at the beginning of the war, many colleagues from international organizations were asking me, why do we have so little field reporting from Ukraine? Well, that's, that's your answer. Uh, because we didn't have the resources and the money to actually protect the reporters and give, give them the opportunity to do their jobs. Because just to make one thing clear is that to me, there is no Russian media and Ukrainian media. <laughs> there is Russian propaganda and there is some leftovers of Russian, you know, independent media who basically publish stories with, with cut out sentences. We can debate the, you know, reasons for that, but that's a different story. But for now, the world relies on Ukrainian media reporting and on what Ukrainian journalists bring to the table on the truth they dig out, risking their lives. Sometimes it's a 50-50%, you know, chance of dying when going to do a field report. And you, of course it is directly connected to uh, the resources and the money. We all know that security can be essentially bought. It can be, you know, money can be used to uh, buy bulletproof vests. It can be used to buy insurances. It's very expensive, as, as Jeremy pointed out. It can be used to relocate the staff. It can be used to relocate the office to, you know, set up a new studio or whatever. And this is something, you know, we need to keep in mind. Uh, for decades, 
Ukrainian media worked in a very distorted market where, you know, oligarch-funded media outlets had everything and independent media outlets had to basically struggle and fight for life all the time. And this is not, you know, Ukrainian media didn't prepare for the invasion, not because they didn't believe it would happen, but because they had to choose between paying their staff salaries monthly and, and buying a bunch of bulletproof vests. That's the reality we were in. And, you know, there's a lot has already been done to, to change that, but it's still something, uh, you know, still something we are struggling with. So, yes, answering your question, it's, it's directly connected. So, Darina, we have a question um, online, and um, they're asking us to discuss some of the, this is from Alexandra, thank you for the question, uh, some of the concrete risks and threats that Ukrainian media workers are facing and how the international community can, can help now. And I'd also like you to expand not just international community, but what also can um, donors and funders, obviously, but also advertisers and tech platforms, what could those stakeholders do um, to respond to the, the risks and the threats? Well, I think there is a lot to be done. Uh, we, you know, the international community really stepped up and did, you know, did a lot of things. Uh, a lot of productive gear was brought to Ukrainian journalists and now we have it, though, you know, it took quite some time. But there's a lot, there, a lot of things need to be done and will be a priority moving forward as well. So one thing that uh, I think is important that uh, Ukrainian newsrooms have to be provided with a runway. Basically, they had to be funded for some long term, you know, with some institutional multi year funding where they don't have to worry about paying monthly salaries for some time while, you know, taking their time to adapt to the new circumstances, maybe developing new revenue streams or something that would keep them sustainable for, for the future. I, I do believe that the donors and the funders have to switch from programmatic funding to uh, institutional support these days and make it multi-year. Uh, one, one reason for that is, it, you know, stable salaries, I, you know, I'm not even talking about higher salaries, but at least stable salaries can kind of stop the brain drain from the newsrooms that is inevitable by now because many people had to relocate with their families to Europe and Trust me on this one, Ukrainian media salaries can't have them, you know, provided for in Europe. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, programmatic funding, uh, the usual one provided by donor community, takes a lot of resources for the, you know, frequent reporting and stuff. And these resources would be better used to develop new revenue streams, as I said, that will sustain this media in the future. Because, you know, as the war fatigue settles in, probably, uh, there won't be a lot of funding and a lot of crowdfunding that Ukrainian media can do, but they have to adapt and develop new revenue streams. The other thing I think is that um, we need to actually look into what uh, Ukrainian media need and to actually make an effort to research uh, the needs of Ukrainian media to see what media are on the map, what are their primary struggles and how can we help. Um, from what I know, the Fix and, and Jeff and Guy are now working on a tool to map out donor support and match it with the needs of Ukrainian media market. I, I think that's something that's really needed to be done because as you know, as we move forward and this conflict drags on, the, there will be a lot of different struggles and it's not like you know all the Ukrainian media would have one problem. Uh, there can be multiple problems and we have to respond wisely to all of them. And uh, I think most importantly, probably, is that we have to understand what this fight is actually about. It's about truth against lies. And truth is provided by Ukrainian journalists. And international companies, uh, distribution platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Google, have to step up and have to stand with Ukraine in this truth fight and have to lift up the, uh, the high quality reporting provided by Ukrainian journalists, have to help us distribute the truthful information because that's only how we can win this war. I mean, you know Ukraine, Ukrainians will fight tooth and nail until the last drop of blood, but you know, without the international support and without your help amplifying our voice, this victory will 
be much more expensive. Thank you, Darina. Um, I'm going to open up for comments and questions very shortly, but um, I just wanted to say that I, I could have asked Darina to talk, for example, much more about what the, the FIX, an organization that she co-founded, has done to crowdfund over a million euros and to sustain um, over a dozen uh, media in Ukraine, or about the chatbot, which is providing answers to journalists who have queries about where they can find assistance. I could have asked Jeremy and Rebecca to talk more about their assistance that they're providing, and I could have asked um, Sergei to talk about the, uh, the press freedom and solidarity centers which they are um, running in Ukraine. But I didn't because I wanted to leave time for questions for all of you and also because my colleagues at GFMD have created a, uh, a mapping sheet where if you want information about what's happening in Ukraine, um, we can give you access to that and also have details on our website. So there's, I don't want to waste time talking about um, the, res the individual responses, but please come and uh, talk to me if you want access to that information. So for our speakers, pens at the ready, what I'm going to do is take the questions from the chat or questions, comments from the audience. And after we've heard all of them, I'm going to come back to you all to, for a final comment. And also you can then in that period address any of the questions that have have been raised. Now, do we have, we have a microphone? Um, so yes, could I first come to Ala Sodevnik, who is a journalist from the public broadcasting company of Ukraine, uh, who is with us here in Uruguay. Please, Ala. Uh, thank you so much. And um, as my colleague from Albania mentioned it on the beginning of the conference, uh, what is happening in Ukraine is just not about a freedom of press, it's uh, just about freedom uh, as, it, as it is. So uh, my colleagues, especially from the public broadcasting company, uh, they, some of them, they are still staying on the occupied territories and uh, on the cities uh, near the front line on the constantly uh, shelter uh, from Russians. And um, they risk their lives. And they do this because they believe in our victory and that they work uh, important. So when they do this and when they know that in some days they could be kidnapped or killed, it's very important, I think, to understand that those peoples who will do this and did this with uh, our other colleagues uh, will have their resp responsibility for this and um, they will be to bring them to justice. So um, I wanted to ask, is, is it possible to bring to justice Russia and Russian authorities? Because what they are doing now in Ukraine, it's like um, an example for other countries with dictatorships to do the same. And if Russia will not be punished, it will be like um, the good example, I mean, not a good, but bad example for everyone to do the same. And uh, that journalists in the world will be in the more um, danger than they are now. Thank, Thank you. you for that question. There are no questions online so far. Does anyone else in the room have a, a question or a comment before we go to, to final remarks? Okay. Well, thank you. Allah for that question and thank you for the amazing work that you and your colleagues are doing investigating war crimes in Ukraine and documentary work that you're doing. Um, it's amazing work and we thank you for the bravery and the professionalism of your colleagues and of course those of members of the National New Journalists of Ukraine and the work of Darina's colleagues at the Kiev Independent. Um, Darina, I'll come to you first for a, a short final comment and if you'd like to respond to, to Allah's comment as well. Um, unfortunately, you know, I have the same question. <laughs> I uh, would really want to ask, you know, I, I, I'd say I would really want to believe that there will be a point in, in the human history where Russia is brought to justice for everything uh, this state has done. And um, I don't only mean the attack on press freedom, I mean the attack on 
all the humanitarian values that this world developed in the last centuries. Uh, because what they are doing is outrageous and it can't be tolerated. But from what I see is that the world is still trying to kind of play games where, you know, there is Russia as an, you know, a player and we have to consider something about them. But, you know, this is a very dangerous path. Um, you know, concerning press freedom, but also concerning the whole security system of the world. And I just hope that at the end of this, everybody understands what it is about. And everybody understands that, you know, the importance of the war in Ukraine is very simple. You can be next. Any one of you can be next. If something like this can happen in the 21st century, you know, some, some country can just go and bomb another country for no reason, because let's be clear, there is no reason for that then it can happen to any one of you. Any country can do that to any other country. Any country can lose their press freedom, can lose their people, they can be raped, killed, kidnapped, taken hostage, you know, it just can happen. And I just hope we stop playing games and start figuring out real mechanism to keep Russia accountable uh, and to just have them stop. Thank you, Torino. Um, Jeremy, your final comments, please. Yeah, on that question about can we bring Russia to justice, I think when you're just a normal person, I'm not a politician, I don't have a mandate to do anything, you, you just care about justice and social justice and the values that you're talking about. And we often just despair about the way the international intergovernmental community fails to bring perpetrators of violence to justice so often. It's why we have impunity running at, at, at such high levels. But at the same time, the work that journalists are doing now is providing the fuel for the cases that will inevitably come. And maybe not Russia as a whole, maybe not everybody, but there will be people who will be brought to justice for what they have done to Ukraine and Ukrainian people um, in, it may be the coming years. It is such a slow process of international justice, but I genuinely believe the work that is being done now is contributing to the possibility um, of that um, happening. Just as a, 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 a very final comment, I mean, as I tried to show um, in my earlier comments, when we talk about the needs of, of Ukrainian media, let's make sure that we put Ukrainian journalists at the heart of that conversation. Let us listen to them and make sure it is their voices that are heard, that it's not in Washington or London or Brussels that we decide what is best for the future um, of Ukrainian media, but that their needs for equipment and decent work and fair pay and training and the resources to be independent are what really sets our agenda going forward um, to support Ukrainian journalists and media. Thank you, Jeremy, and um, I'll certainly in, in, endorse that. Um, Rebecca, your final comments and remarks, please. Just listening to this, and that was all very powerful, and I, I agree with many of these points on a professional and personal level, but when we come back to really specifically media freedom and the safety of journalists, one uh, concern that I have is that sometimes so many of our efforts are focused on ending impunity, on you know, sort of addressing these attacks after they happen. And don't get me wrong, that's very important at RSF. We're also working to document uh, crimes as they happen, to litigate them, to ensure that there's political and legal accountability whenever possible. Because as we all know, generally speaking, there's still impunity for the vast majority of killings of journalists worldwide. But that's exactly why more efforts are needed on preventive uh, measures to ensure that we're not dealing with so many of these cases afterwards to proactively protect journalists in the first instance. So some of the global solutions that we are working on at RSF are, are focused more on that side, the preventive efforts. Um, anything, for, for example, we're advocating for the creation of a mandate at the UN that would be a sort of protector of journalists because the existing machinery is responding more to the aftermath and not really 
uh, working to alert and sort of mobilize when it is most needed. But also I think for states and for bodies um, such as the United Nations to respond better to early warning signs, even when it's not necessarily something that looks immediately connected to physical violence. So we've touched, um, in particular with Jeremy, you touched earlier on you know, disinformation. Warning signs were here for many years. Um, and, and Russia is not the only actor internationally that is waging these propaganda wars. This is a very extreme example now of how that can manifest in real life and cause actual violence. Uh, but this has been a problem that has been steadily building for many years. And so um, it, I think it is time to, for a sort of wake up call on needing to um, take a more holistic uh, approach to all of these threats to media freedom to realize that many of even these other areas such as disinformation can have an impact on the safety of journalists and to get better at acting in a preventive way to ensure uh, that, that we can you know, we can be working side by side with those who shouldn't have lost lost their lives in, in conflicts such as this uh, and, and help to ensure really that what, what this is about is telling the story of what's happening. We need journalists to inform us everywhere. We need them to be alive and safe to do their jobs and we need an enabling environment for that to happen. Thank you, Rebecca. Ms. Teresa Ribeiro, could I come to you for your final remarks, please? Yes, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like and to underline once again what uh, what has been said by, uh, by the previous speakers, my colleagues in this panel, that we need to end impunity and to end impunity is really uh, a key responsibility for all of us. And the, and the journalists, they are uh, right now doing, uh, contributing to, uh, to, the, to end this impunity in the near future, collecting evidence based of crime wars, of, uh, of violations of uh, humanitarian law. So uh, their work is really important also uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in that particular uh, framework. Uh, also fact-finding missions to really, again, to, to really document what is going on uh, uh, on the ground is uh, very important. But one, one final remark, as we don't have much time left, it is important to support media and journalists working in Ukraine on all possible levels. And for this, we need the different actors that are represented on this panel today. Equally important, it will be also essential to think about the future of the media in a war-torn society, when the fighting has ceased and the rebuilding has started. I think this is very important it's very important to invest in and support one of the bad rocks of democracy, which is the free and independent media. It's not just about information. This is about democracy. It's about the pillars of democracy that we need to fight for and we need to vigorously defend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, uh, Sergei Tomolenko. Um, from the National Union of Journalists of Ukraine. Could you give us um, a final remark, please? Okay. First of all, when we're discussing about uh, Russian responsibility, I want to say that we, uh, National Union of Journalists of Ukraine, we are supporting the idea of establishing special international tribunal against Russia for war crimes against uh, uh, media workers and journalists on this war. And um, as my final remark, I uh, um, want to thank uh, for this uh, uh, productive uh, discussion or conference and uh, the help of the international community is very important for Ukrainian journalists. Special thanks uh, to UNESCO for providing 125 vests uh, and helmets for, of protective equipment for Ukrainian foreign journalists in Ukraine. This is very important aspect for safety uh, and uh, for that who are covering the war um, in Ukraine. And uh, we also look forward to implementing special program of economic support of Ukrainian journalists. The National Union of Journalists of Ukraine is developing our own special network of the Journalist Solidarity Centers supported by the International Federation of Journalists. And recently we <coughs> 
representatives of the UNESCO, Guillermo Canella and uh, Saurla McCabe, visited our center in Lviv, and we had a good opportunity on the ground to discuss all the challenges that the, the Ukrainian journals have. The issue of economic stability is especially important for us. And uh, I think that it's our duty, uh, all of us on this conference in UNESCO and the world, to help Ukrainian journalists and the Ukrainian media and to preserve the access of Ukrainians to sources of reliable information. Journalists are important, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, um, a few weeks ago, at the International Jersey Festival in Perugia, members and partners of the Global Forum for Media Development came together to launch the Perugia Declaration for Ukraine, which calls for greater support for Ukrainian media and journalists, and it has specific recommendations to international media and journalists, to private and public donors and funders of professional journalism, to the EU, EU member states, the Media Freedom Coalition, and all states that care about the right to freedom of expression and access to information. It also has calls specifically to technology companies, telecoms, internet intermediaries, and advertisers about what they can do to support media in Ukraine. It's been signed by over 200 organizations. It's available in 10 languages, including Ukrainian, Russian, and Belarusian, and relevant to many of those who are here today, it's also available in Spanish and Portuguese. So I'd like to implore you all to join us in showing solidarity with our colleagues in Ukraine. Find the declaration online, Proof Declaration for Ukraine. You can find it on our social media platform. Share it, sign it, republish it, write about it. But most importantly, please read it. Read it and work out what you can do as an individual or as an organization, and read it and think about what we can do collectively. We've had many great suggestions here today that I think that we need to, to follow up and make sure that they happen. I'm gonna conclude just by quoting a short part of the declaration. The targeting and torturing and killing of journalists in Ukraine is abhorrent and must be stopped. Those responsible must be held accountable and brought to justice under national and international law. Vicious online attacks against news organizations, individual journalists must also cease. We condemn Russia's attacks on press freedom and free expression in Ukraine in the strongest possible terms. The safety and security of all journalists to report freely is essential to ensure the world understands the reality and the facts of the ongoing war, including the humanitarian consequences. We stand in solidarity with all journalists and independent media covering Russia's aggression against Ukraine. The greater the threat to the lives of Ukrainian journalists, their livelihoods and ability to do their jobs, the greater our efforts will be to support them. For the sake of the immediate future and safety of our Ukrainian colleagues and the long-term viability of independent public interest journalism everywhere, this is a moment that we all need to rise to. So thank you all, and please give a warm reaction to our speakers, especially to, to Allah, to Darina, and to Sergei. Thank you very much.